Portage County Board of Supervisors meeting, recorded October 5, 2021. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I, I'll ask um, that everybody please be seated. Uh, I'm going to <laughs> tell a little story. <laughs> Goodness knows that uh, anyone who knows me, I can sometimes run long. So uh, I've I've been given the honor of uh, speaking tonight of my remem remembrances of our dear colleague Anton Ande. Um. So if I get emotional, um, please forgive me. Back in 1969, my parents were divorcing, 13 years old, and um, things were very hard for me. And I took this class, Russian history, with this brand new teacher. His name was Anton Ande. And he recognized the challenges that I was facing. Um, my friends were not talking to me because back in 1969, families who divorced, somehow the kids were not, not to be talked to. It was some kind of disease. Mr. Ande, and I'm sorry, I still have to call him Mr. Ande. I will always remember him that way. I have a hard time calling him Anton. Mr. Ande was always there for me in class and after class. He would listen to my my pain and he understood. And as a part of listening to that pain, he got me interested in history and in literature, specifically poetry. And he worked with me through that semester and the next, and he ended up being my forensics coach. He knew that if I would get involved in something other than the pain, and what he told me at that time, and I still remember this, he goes, when I was facing the deepest, darkest part of escaping from a, a communist bloodbath, he goes, I always found solace in, in literature, in, in history. And while I was trying to escape something not nearly as bad, he gave me that. And the poetry was important because he ended up being my forensics coach. He took a very frightened, very sad, very lonely child and gave her something to be proud of. I went to state with him and won a first for reading a trilogy of poems from Dr. Zhivago, Boris Pasternak. It's one of my proudest days as a student, he changed my life. And this is just one small little part of the lives that he's changed in this community. Countless kids who he helped see the value of history because history helps us mark our future. He was a fabulous man. We will all miss him. We were lucky to serve with him. And my proudest moment on this board was sitting at a committee with him, the man who changed my life in 1969. Please take a moment to remember Anton Ande. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Review and approval of September 21st, 2021 minutes. Motion by Supervisor Barry Jakowski, seconded by Supervisor Dubeck. Corrections, changes. You just take a voice vote. You don't want to do civic on this. Mm -hmm. We're going to use the computers being we have a civic clerk online and stuff so we want to make sure that we can <clears throat> we can uh otherwise i'll just take a voice but uh, 
Don't do anything. I got this. have 22 approved very good <laughs> correspondence none public notice members of the public who would wish to address the county board on specific agenda items must register their requests at this time with such comments subject to reasonable control of the county board chair set forth in Robert's rules mm -hmm. order anybody like to speak today no okay Resolutions and ordinances. Number three, elected officials compensation for April 2022 through April 2024 term for the county board chair and amending ordinance 3.1.47. Motion by Supervisor Matt Joukowsky, <coughs> seconded by Supervisor <coughs> Pataki. Discussion. No discussion. Uh, Supervisor Morrissey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just thought I'd explain my, my no vote on this. Um, it has nothing to do with our county board chair. It just has to do with the position. Um, I just have a, you know, I feel that this this position is, is it's highly paid. And I, I respect the fact that it does take quite a bit of work. Um, however, we're, we're in the top five of county board chairs in the state uh, who are being being paid right now. We also have a county executive. Uh, so I'm not quite sure why we're choosing to pay uh, kind of double dip, I guess, on, uh, on this position. So I just wanted to, to let people know that. Um, we're, we're giving essentially a 2% pay raise uh, plus, we're giving what happened in the uh, the meeting, the HR meeting, is that we added a per diem per full county board meeting to this salary. So the pay increase on this is is quite a bit. You know, it's about seven hundred bucks plus two percent um, because it does look a little bit cleaner that way, rather than having you know county board chair getting paid per diems. But I just question why we're paying county board chair, any county executive, and a county board chair, which is in the, like I said, the top five in the state, and uh, we're not even within the top five for populations uh, in the state. So if anybody had any questions about that, that's why I voted against this. <clears throat> Supervisor Barry Joukowsky. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I don't have any questions for Supervisor Moresi. I guess he just has never walked in your shoes. Thank you. I want to remind everybody it's always about the position, not the person. Uh, anytime we've had HR meetings, it's always, I've said it, I think I've heard others say it too, that it's it's um, the position and not the, not the person. Uh, I would hope that whoever's sitting in this is doing the best that they can with what they have and with what's before them. Uh, and we don't know what the future has to bring. I, uh, I know that there's a lot of time and energy uh, spent with this and a lot of other phone calls and emails and that go on and it's become more and more time consuming more and more involved in today's environment. And that's all I'll say about <clears throat> it, so. Supervisor Gussell. Uh, my comment is this, Portage County. Please, please use the mic chart. So can you get the, there you go, thank you, sir. 
So the people at home can hear you. My comment is this. I feel that Portage County's got a lot of things going. It needs someone that's capable of and has the knowledge to do all these things. And that takes a lot of time, a lot of effort, and a lot of knowledge. Anybody else? We have no more comments. Uh, all in favor, vote yes and oppose no. And then you gotta hit the save. Yeah, just use your finger. Did yours come up, Stan? Okay. Yep, he did. All right, we have 20 in favor, one against Supervisor Moresi, one abstained, Supervisor Haga, and two excused, Supervisors Mula and Martinson, and one vacant. Uh, motion approved. Number four, authorizing a contract between Portage County and MSA Professional Services, Inc. for environmental inspections for a five-year term. Motion by Supervisor Dodge, second by Supervisor Medine. Discussion? There's no discussion. All those in favor, vote yes and oppose no. <clears throat> 22 in favor, two excused, Supervisor Martinson and Mua, and one vacant, resolution adopted. Presentations, County Executive Holman, State of the County Address and Budget Presentation, Lights, Camera, Action. <laughs> All right, thank you, Mr. Chair, and good good evening, everybody. Good evening, Chris. Good to see you all, everybody at home as well. So um, here it is, the budget presentation in State of the County. Uh, as usual, I try to talk about the State of the County through the lens of the county as an organization. So I'll certainly hit on a lot of numbers today, and Jenny will follow as well. But I'll try to give you sort of a, uh, a more global perspective, you know, sort of, sort of the, the big things happening that I see out there from uh, since we're dealing with all of them all the time. Um, as I go through the slides, I think Lee will switch it for the people who are watching at home. But if you're a supervisor and you have an electronic version at home, you can also follow along that way. So the first slide is just about our fiscal framework, which I include every time, mostly because I want anybody picking it up for the first time to understand how do we approach this. So members of the public or others should know that, you know, the budget is, uh, often viewed as something that's static and immovable, but that's not really what it is. It's a living, breathing thing, but we do have to go through this process to sort of set that floor to operate from, and that's where we're at. Um, the projections that we have in there are certainly uh, moving targets due to some of the unknowns, and that's more true now today than ever, I think. But the process that we do follow ensures that departments have what they need in their budgets now to do what they're doing today, and then if they need something because of a change down the road, the money's still there to help them. So people don't have sort of nest eggs sitting around for a rainy day. We make sure that people run tight budgets and then we also make sure that we have the support for them should they need it. Um, which the second bullet point there just shows you that departments don't get to keep their surpluses. Uh, we do get asked from time to time if they can, but generally speaking, if you have a surplus, that all gets pooled together and goes back in the general fund so that we can address gaps wherever they may be. Um, the county also, as you'll see later in the numbers, really lives off of grants and intergovernmental funds from the feds and from the state government. And so we make a lot of decisions from a fiscal perspective that really ensure we're doing that side of our job as well as possible because those are all non-levy sources of funding, which are the majority of the funds that make the county work. So it really needs to be a stable source. Um, <clears throat> obviously we exercise care in all of our decision making. And I just say that because people don't often know that what a levy limit policy means, right? They don't understand that it just doesn't give you a lot of room to maneuver. And so when you don't have that much room, it's really important to make sort of these prudent decisions uh, so that you can help make as much room as possible as you go through the year. For the budget assumptions, 
Clearly, the budget's focused on preserving our financial integrity. It, it is balanced and it does not create a structural deficit, all very important things. Uh, you'll see there that the operating levy, as usual, is limited to net new construction. This year, that's an increase of 1.894%. Uh, it's not a lot, but I will say that it is more than many other counties. And quite honestly, I don't know how some of them make it work because they're less than 1%. So we're pretty fortunate as a smaller rural county to get this sort of increase year to year. Uh, the net increase for the operating levy portion is $432,108. That's the increase for the entire county. So we got to spread that out across the board. A lot of that is made up in salaries and wages, benefits, things like that. So if really big issues happen, then that's why we have fund balances to rely upon. And if we have, didn't have a fund balance that we could rely upon, it would force some pretty hard decisions. So thankfully we have a very good fund balances across the board. Um, the overall levy increase, and what that means is that there's different categories, and I'll go over those, is $669,505. So that includes debt service, EMS, bridge and culvert aid, things like that. Uh, the budget does include an increase of roughly $200,000 back into capital improvement. Uh, that's important because we did take some money out of it last year when there was a lot more uncertainty uh, so that we could make that budget work. So we have a goal of getting a million dollars of levy funding in there if we can ever do it because capital improvement is something that we really need to stay on top of. I don't, if the, the closer we can get to that, the better. So this is helping us get back to where we were before everything hit. Uh, and as usual, I always give departments a 0% target to, to hit for their operations. Now we handle the wages and the salary fringe, things like that, but for their day-to-day -day operations, they, they have to hit a 0% if they can. Uh, a lot of them cannot, but most of the time that's because of things like utilities and facilities. They don't get to t call up WPS and tell them to change their rates. Uh, the bottom uh, graphic there just shows you the 2022 levy per $1,000 of equalized value, and I'll just walk through that real quick. Uh, so this is showing that overall levy increase. You've got the operating levy, the health care center referendum, which contributes <laughs> that service levy, countywide EMS levy, and then bridge and culvert aid. So on the far right, you see how much the increases were from last year. And then associated beneath each one, you see what the tax rate is per $1,000. So the total levy for the county with all categories this year is $33,406,098, which translates into a, a rate of $5.03 per $1,000 of value. That's down from last year. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. But you'll also note there at the bottom that this portion of, of the budget is only 28% of the $119 million budget that we have. So that shows you how much of our bread and butter is made up of grants, fi federal funding, and state funding. What we, what we take from taxpayers is only that 28%. Uh, the next slide there shows a tax rate for the last 10 years. Uh, you'll see that we kind of bounce around in the five five dollars to five twenty five realm the average is five dollars and eighteen cents but I wanted to just make it clear that this is a number under the levy limit policy that we don't really have any control over uh, outside of the fact that we do maximize we can we, we can take up to one point eight nine four percent and we certainly take it all because we need it uh, now if you took much less then that might change that number but you know, but the point is is that once you establish the decision that we're going to take the allowed increase of the budget that number then works through a bunch of formulas and calculations, which ends up spitting out this number. And so that's how it, that's what's driving a lot of fluctuation there. The median home value, that is up from last year, no surprise. So you see $168,100, that's a median home value in the county. So the owner of that home would expect to pay, just as an example, $845.54 per year for their county levy. And that is down from last year. So that's a function of more houses, more buildings, more entities existing that the overall number is going through. Uh, the next slide is last year's unknowns. I just thought it was important to touch on these because last year we really didn't know where these were headed. So I'll just touch upon them, but there's other things. Other, later I'll talk more about a couple of them. So as you know or may have heard, the healthcare center is on the path to a referendum in April 22 and possibly November 22, depending on the outcome. So that regardless of whatever anybody thinks about it, is the path that we're on. And so there's a lot of certainty involved in the fact that we've made decisions to put us on that path, and that's a good thing. Uh, the infrastructure bullet, 
Uh, just to update you that Space and Properties <coughs> tasked me and staff with seeking owner's representative services at their last meeting, and that's part of our ordinance. Uh, there's alternatives you could look for, but uh, through discussions with uh, a variety of our, our partners and stakeholders, it made sense to move forward with that. That discussion is ongoing. It will be an RFP process that will go back through the committee. And so my target is to have that process completed in November of this year. Uh, the owner's representative would then work with the county to look at the appropriate time to seek construction management services. Now, that doesn't mean that you're automatically going to start building things. It just means that you have that person at the table who, if you make those decisions as part of that design process, is involved from day one. So that would happen at, an, at a later date. That's not happening right now. Uh, but essentially, if something were to take place, you would have the owner's representative, the county, and the construction management services all working together. The COVID-19 response, clearly that's ongoing. I just, I'll, I'll make a note of it a couple times because in my opinion, a lot of the efforts that have been put forth by staff, public health, EMS, you know, across the board have been, you know, nothing short of heroic in sense in the way, the things that they've had to deal with. Um, so I just wanted to thank them for that. But, you know, staff has done a lot of work here and no one has had an easy path through the pandemic. So uh, there's still not a lot of, knowns associated with that, though I think there's a lot more than there were last year, so I wanted to just touch on that briefly. Moving on to debt service. The debt service levy, or debt service in general in Portage County has been managed very effectively and long before I got in this position. So, you know, from my point of view, the county has been in a very good position as it pertains to debt service for some time. There's a number of factors that play into that, but as I note, the, we've been planning for years to have the county ready if, they, if the county moves into a larger project sort of direction. Uh, that planning includes anticipating the need of future debt for projects that are already in the capital improvement plan as well. So you're trying to balance what we're doing year to year with the potential projects so that, um, as you'll see later, you, you're trying to keep a stable approach for taxpayers. You don't want an up and down, up and down, up and down for people out there. Um, the larger projects that we had, a lot of those we had to do in 2021 because we were just past the window of, you know, we pushed the envelope as far as we could, but we were at a point where we needed to do it. So those larger projects are mostly completed. So 2022, the capital improvement plan is mostly smaller projects. It's not a lot. Again, it's situated uh, for, you know, which direction are we going to go in? So the debt service tax levy did increase a little bit. Uh, but that's based on existing debt service schedules. Uh, that increases the debt service a little bit. Uh, again, as I said, to maintain that stable platform from this perspective. So uh, we've also structured our repayment planning so that we do it quickly. So we do $3 million, $4 million borrows, and we pay them off quickly. And what that does is it doesn't stretch out any obligations for the county, again, so that if a decision is made, whether it's deferred maintenance or a new building or revamping the buildings we have, that we're able to move in that direction and not have a dramatic impact. Uh, there's also, uh, if you've been tuning into finance, there's a lot of really good conversations around this lately about debt service policy, debt service in general, and also how that ties into the conversations around infrastructure. The next slide there with capital improvement projects and funding, I'll say it again, we keep planning in a way that emphasizes that sustainable, forward-looking, you know, anticipating some some choices being made in the near future. Uh, we are poised to move forward here, and in a lot of ways, despite all of the ups and downs that we've seen just in the economy and in general, and even though it's taken some time for us to have these conversations, we're really in a situation that's probably better than ever to start making these decisions in an, and not have sort of a, a shock to the system, if you will. So. As far as capital improvements goes and as far as infrastructure discussions go, we are very well situated, and that's all because of the planning that's gone into this area of the budget. Uh, the revenue highlights. I'll touch on sales tax mostly because last year sales tax was extremely volatile. It was positive one month, and then it would go, it would plunge negative the next. At the end of the year, it ended up being slightly higher uh, on an annual basis, which you know, it was actually good because, you know, sales tax is roughly six, seven million dollars of our budget. Um, there is an anticipated increase, but because we're not quite sure how it's going to play out uh, and forward analytics from the counties association had numbers slightly higher than ours, we budgeted conservatively. So we so there 
if, if the numbers actually turn out better than our conservative projections, that'll provide some funding, one-time funding down the road for fund balances or some other issue that may crop up. Uh, the main thing I really wanna emphasize here is that you may have heard in meetings over the years that Brown County got sued by an, an entity uh, that basically is challenging the way the counties use sales tax. And so the, the primary argument is essentially that they want counties to offset the levy with the sales tax amount that they use. So if that were, they, they, Brown County won in the lower courts uh, and the WCA is actually heavily involved in this. So if you know Andy Phillips, he, you know, give him an email because he, he can tell you everything you want to know about it. But they won in the lower courts, but it's been brought through the system and the Supreme Court agreed to, agreed to take it up. And so that has a lot of people a little worried the case is strong, but if the outcome at the Supreme Court turns out that everything needs to change for counties as they approach sales tax, that would mean that we would then have to start offsetting our budget with that amount, which would be uh, six to seven million dollars in offsets is not a small number for any county, let alone Portage County. So keep an eye on that. Um, going into county employees there, the budget does include the steps within the salary plan that happen every year. And this year we added 1.25% to the plan itself. Uh, in the last three years, we've added 1%. Last year, a lot of counties did a hiring freeze or did 0% or whatever. We maintained the 1% despite everything. This year, because 2022 presents a tiny window for us to do more, because we know that in 2023, for instance, the annual hour standards go gonna go up eight hours. So we're gonna have to account for eight additional hours for all employees. 2024 is a leap year, so you're gonna have another eight hours you're gonna have to account for, uh, which is all well and good. It just means that this was the time where we're gonna say, if we can add something to this, let's try to do what we can. And so that's the number that we agreed to. Uh, the new vacation policy is a big hit with departments, with employees. So that was a major step in a direction for the county overall. And just a couple notes on the health insurance fund is that it continues to be very strong uh, in how it's being managed. And this year, through our conversations, we've, you know, we're working on implementing sort of a multi-year strategy for bringing various line items within that into uh, more stable or strategic alignment, I guess you would call it, so that they're best situated to keep employees in a real stable position as it pertains to health insurance. And the last bullet there I think is very important too, because we're not easily able to provide additional pay for people. You know, I just kind of covered some of that, but we are able to maintain the benefits by keeping health insurance premiums flat. And that, in today's world, that is unique. So that's a major plus for our employees. And the, the longer we can manage this fund that way, and the HR committee and HR have done a wonderful job of that, and, and finance as well, uh, the better employees are gonna be just in general. It's, it's a as we all know, it's a major source of uh, headaches for people just out in the world. Uh, new positions and reclassifications. So I'll, if you have questions about these, certainly ha happy to answer them. I'll just run through them somewhat quickly, but the IT network analyst is one that I proposed through the finance committee uh, because we did an internal audit of the IT department this year with CLA. And there were a number of findings, but one of them was just the incredible workload they have from county users. You know, they help, I need something because this is broken or whatever it might be, or, you know, my, my voting tablet doesn't work, things like that. The, the, that amount of work was so high, it's peeling them away from other projects that also need to be done. And then sometimes they need to be done no matter what. And so then people are not getting the service that they're wanting over here. And people are paying into that fund through a, an internal service fund. So it's kind of like an enterprise that way. And people, you know, departments rightfully expect if I pay this much that I should get some service, but everybody obviously pays into the pot. The point is, is that this position will help that department better manage the services that they're providing, and not only county employees, but the requirements, the workload, the new things from cybersecurity that we get hacked all the time, all kinds of things that are, we don't get hacked, but people try to hack us. Uh, all of those things are, there's from the state and federal government are, those requirements are getting heavier and heavier. And so being able to keep up with all those is super crucial because as we all know, everything runs out on, on IT. The Highway County Road Foreman, 
They've been running with a relief foreman for some time, but this move basically gives them more flexibility with their situation and stabilizes things for the folks doing the work out there. So generally speaking, you know, it, there's some levy portion, but there's also user fees. So it's, it's an easier ask. It's not, a, it's not a big hit, and it actually helps the highway department do what they need to do. Um, a lot of the enterprise funds are that way. You know, it's not necessarily fair to view them completely differently, but it does help from a kind of a big picture perspective that they've got a litany of revenue streams that they can kind of balance out, whereas some departments are strictly levy. The child welfare resource supervisor, this was a position that we initially thought might be done through that American Rescue Plan Act that you, funding that you approved at your recent meeting. Um, but when you really look at the trends we've seen in that division for some time now and where they're at now, you have one supervisor managing all the social workers who themselves have double or triple the caseloads. So in general, the situation there is exceptionally challenging. And so the idea that one person can effectively manage everything through that system, it made more sense to say if we can make it a permanent addition to that division, it's going to shore them up and give not only the supervisors in that division a better ability to do the management that they need, but it's going to be better support for the social workers and it's going to ultimately be better services for the, for the, for the people who are getting service from the social workers, children, families, and otherwise. So we managed to make it work with levy funding. The Sheriff's Office Communication Supervisor, as you know, the Sheriff often uh, requests six new positions uh, in pairs. So the pairs are hard to, to do at once. And we've had, the Sheriff and I have talked quite a lot about this. This year, the communication supervisor was a real priority within his office. And at HR, Supervisor Joukowsky had actually asked, as I was reporting this to them, you know, what does the overtime picture look like in the comm center? You know, how many hours are deputies working, for instance? So like, if that was like a, a, a financial figure that was high enough, maybe it would make sense to offset some of that overtime use with a position. So the sheriff ran the numbers, and then he, Jenny, and I put our heads together, and essentially through the surplus in his uh, office, but also just our the surplus, the small surplus we had in the countywide budget, we we split the difference, and we managed to piece together a position that gets him one position now. We can't commit necessarily next year, for instance, to say, yeah, we'll hire another one, but we do know that due to scheduling implications and just um, better approach overall in terms of how he views his staffing, that that second position would be something that we need to keep our eyes on as we move forward. So it doesn't answer everything now. It's not ideal, but nothing we're doing financially is ideal, to be frank. So it does give them support now. It'll reduce the number of overtime hours there, which I think was roughly 1,200 hours at the time. Or I think it, that was just the Comtex. Uh, so we made that one work. And that I updated finance and HR prior to tonight so that they knew because my report didn't include it at the time. The park seasonal assistant manager, this is a – very, it's a part-time, not a big fiscal a hit as a position, but it needs to run through the levy uh, so that it can be advertised and so on and so forth. So it's a, a, a much smaller piece of that new position puzzle. The rest of the positions that you see are in HHS. Those are all grant-funded positions. And typically, you know, Ray is good at saying, like, if the grant funding goes away, the positions go away. But there's another truth to it in the sense that if through these grant funded positions, maybe a better way to approach a given topic emerges and that would say, okay, we'll restructure things in a way that is more efficient or just better for whatever the outcome might be. So even if the grant funding might go away, there could be an opportunity there to take advantage of something that emerges through the grant work. And so if that happens, it's possible that maybe one of those positions would stick around, but that would, that would be offset somewhere else. Uh, the reclassifications, uh, there are only two the, that were granted the facilities administrative associate for. This was one that the justification for, it, it made sense on paper, but then when we talked to McGrath about it, for her it was a real slam dunk because based on the justifications, the job duties, et cetera, it probably should have moved uh, sooner. So nevertheless, we're, we're getting that position to where it needs to be. And the highway parts room and shop manager, <clears throat> this one is reflecting the work that that person has been doing for some time now in managing the EMS fleet. So all of the EMS vehicles go through the highway department and, and this person manages that and takes care of that. So when we looked at, you know, what, should it be two steps or one step or what should it be? If you remember when we moved emergency management and, and EMS to the sheriff's office, Chief Deputy Contos at the time, uh, we granted a two-step reclassification. So this clearly wasn't that, and that's why we went with the one-step reclass. The person is doing extra work. It's, it's similar but different, but it's also 
I noted in the report to both committees that if you know the EMS contracts are good through the end of 2023, if the next contract, for instance, took a different path for fleet management and this person no longer did this work, then that we could possibly discuss freezing that position for a year to get them back to where they're doing so that it accurately reflects what they are doing and they aren't just getting this extra step for work they no longer do. Non-county agencies. So over the years, I've looked at how we can try to be a reliable partner here because uh, for all the reasons I've already mentioned, it's tough to say, hey, we have all these issues, but we're going to get involved in someone else's budget in a, in a meaningful way, right? In a really like, oh, if, if county funding goes away, then this is a huge problem. I don't want to be that because we've got our own problems. And so we've managed a non-county agency you know, budgeting in a way that still gives us support to the agency, but doesn't put them or us in a position where if we needed to take that funding away to address a county issue, that we could do it and it wouldn't be a dramatic hit to anybody. Uh, so the Portage County Business Council, it's maintaining its 25,000 per year. Todd Kukon, just as a quick note, if you haven't heard, he's also, re he's not retiring per se, but he's moving on to different, different things. So as executive director of the business council, he's moving on to some professional speaking, some authors, authoring things, things like that, that he's really excited about. I was asked to participate in finding a new executive director. And so we went through that process. And so they found a new ED and that person should start in two weeks, I believe. Um, the new Humane Society contract is in the works. We've been doing a lot of work on that this year. Uh, it's something the county coordinates, and this is something that's often lost on some of the folks in the conversation, is it's ultimately it's a municipal obligation and statute. But the county, kind of like we do with taxes and collecting for some municipalities, we coordinate the effort for the municipalities. Everybody gets in, and it works for, works for people. So this contract should uh, put everybody on the same page, on the same timeline, and really clean it up so that the next longer-term contract gives municipalities some clearer lines for enforcement, uh, but also uh, kind of, I won't call it an airing of the grievances, but people will be able to say, hey, here's things that I'm facing and how can we deal with those more effectively? So those conversations are happening. The annual meeting is on the 13th, so I imagine some of those will come up there as well. But by the end of this year, we'll get, have that contract complete and it'll start in January. Uh, if you remember Rent Ready, is the newest addition. We brought that to you in 2021 through contingency. Uh, it's maintaining a funding level of 4,800 for 2022. Uh, I reached out to Mark Cordes and said, what did the funding do? Like, how did it work? And he said, he said it was great. We helped 11 families directly with that funding and it's been a huge boon to them and they've been getting more success beyond what the county funding helped people with. So as a program, they're, they're really growing in a positive way. And so it made sense after the conversation with him to keep that funding level where it was. Um, the last note here is, you know, with the American Rescue Plan Act, there's lots of conversations. The WCA is spearheading one of them about sort of tourism, kind of getting people moving around the state again. And so there's an initiative that we'll probably look to explore with them. And a lot of my peers, administrators, execs, and so on are, are taking their piece of that county by county. So I'll connect with the the uh, Stevens Point Area Convention and Visitors Bureau to talk about it with them to see like, what do they think? How might it look from their perspective? And then uh, see if we can participate. So at a future date, that could come before you as well. And now for the department headlight, or not headlights, highlights. It could be headlights, it's helping us see. Uh, Starting to sound like me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> there's more here than usual, but that's mainly because this has been an exceptional year. So there's a lot of things that I just wanted to make you aware of. I won't touch on every single thing on a bullet point, but I will try to, some of them I will, because there's, there's some really crucial information there. But I'm leading off of the healthcare center because there's a, a tremendous amount of work that's taking place there. One thing that, you know, we had a CLA market study completed and as that was completed was sort of mid, mid pandemic. And so that's a useful tool in, in the things that we're doing now. But the, the pandemic has really changed the landscape for the industry in ways beyond what that market study even looked at. So that's part of the conversation we're having now to say like, what else is happening? What's, what are people looking for and how are, how are things shifting in the industry so that as we move forward with our conversations, the question, the referendum question we'll pose will reflect something that's based on the reality we know now and not necessarily what the market study reflected last year. There's a lower census, just, you know, number of people in the facility. Uh, that's been, that's driven staffing conversations. They've 
left a lot of positions unfilled, and so we've been shoring that up. Uh, the reduction in bed licenses to 48 uh, was a part of that conversation as well. And just real quickly, I'll say, like, we looked at, you know, because people say, well, why don't you just increase the, the number of people there, and, and maybe that will turn a profit somehow. Now, it wouldn't. But what we did is we said, well, let's actually plot it out and we'll do a staff projection. We'll say, well, at this point, we need this position. At this point, we need that position. And the, the long and short of it was is that where we are now and where you might go, say, at 80 beds, if you had, if you had 80 people in the facility, every, every point along the way from now to there is painful financially and doesn't work. And, and you don't even know if you can staff it because you don't know if the workforce is there. And then at the end of the day, you get to a point where that is essentially the same as where you are now. So at that point, it was really clear, like, why would you then try to expand and, and go through all this pain to get to where you're already at? So there's a number of other considerations there, but that was, I wanted to let you know that we did dive into the numbers and really kind of understand what does staffing need to look like here? Um, the real key bullet point there is the Medicaid reimbursement. We're, we're one of the lowest in the United States. The average cost of providing services, services for a Medicaid resident, which we have more of now because private pays and the <laughs> therapies and the surgeries, there's fewer of them for rehab. Uh, the average cost is $520.73 per day. And the reimbursement of that funding is $187.55. So every day you have a Medicaid patient in that facility, you're getting 36% of the cost reimbursed to you through Medicaid. So it doesn't take long for that to drive a structural deficit that in many ways is completely out of their hands. They could be, they're doing the best job they can. We have great staff. They're doing all kinds of excellent things in that facility, but sometimes people look at it and go, well, why are they doing such a bad job? They're doing a great job. It's just that the federal government and the state government are tying their hands. And on top of it, you've got the pandemic, which is changing the, changing what people are looking for. Um, the, the staff, committee members, and myself, we did vet an opportunity for regionalization with North Central Healthcare. Long story short there, it wasn't going to be viable. And so that we just moved quickly away from that, and that's got us to the path we're on now. And that referendum study and public information campaign are underway, and they're off to a really great start. That firm that we are working with, Dimensions 4 out of Madison, they got the pedal to the floor, and things are moving very smoothly. And I'm very confident that the end, the outcome of that process is going to be an excellent referendum question. And it'll be also good presentations for you and the public to understand what actually is all happening here. Uh, yeah, I already mentioned that in April 22 is when we'll have that referendum going forward, assuming that makes it through the process. Uh, Health and Human Services. I'll just say that the Division of Public Health has been an anchor for the community. I know that this is, you know, contentious times out in the world, but just say from a lived day-to-day -day experience, for the people who are looking for help from them, from the community, from local businesses, from schools, and, and we have community calls uh, every month with hundreds of people on them all asking questions, and that's just one call. They do multiple calls, and they're constantly reaching out. They've, done a, they've been under tremendous pressure for uh, almost two years now, uh, and that support and guidance that they provide to people has been you know, every time I go to a business council meeting or I'm out at an event, people say Gary and Ray are, you know, are helping us tremendously. They deserve a ton of credit. So I just want to make sure I mention that. Uh, and you, you've seen through the positions that have come through here and some of the things we're trying to do to shore up divisions within HHS that a challenging situation in a challenging department is made more complex by the pandemic. And so uh, everything that you've done for them recently has been very good in the sense of giving them the support they need. So I just wanted to thank you again for that. And lastly, of course, uh, Ray's retirement will certainly put the agency in new hands, uh, an inevitability, I suppose. <laughs> uh, but I just want to let you know that we did recently complete the recruitment process for that, and so we're notifying candidates of the selection this week. Um, moving on to IT. Uh, this year, we did have major upgrades to the county network. Those are completed. Uh, long story short, that gives us best practices. It puts us on a better footing for security. Uh, it, we're up to date and we have a strong defense against hacking attempts and things like that. But also if there are any sort of service issues, whatever they may be, we've got redundancy built in. So there's not gonna be a big lag. And previous to this, depending on the nature of the event, you could have a lag that could be a few hours to a few days. And if you're in a sheriff's office, you can't have a few days of lag. So this has been a, a huge step in the right direction. Um, 
we're still we're continuing to take steps to try to move systems at the county away from the AS400 platform. If you don't know what that is, uh, think of it like a typewriter as far as a computer goes. And so that's a major challenge for us because we still have these systems at the county. The state still uses the systems. We still have to communicate with those systems. And so now whenever we go out to hire some of these positions in IT, we're like, hey, we need you to know all the new stuff and how to do the typewriter thingy with the AS400. <laughs> and those people really don't exist. It's hard to find them. So we're moving everything we can off that platform as fast as possible. But because it's all wrapped up in mandatory programs, that's more challenging than you'd want it to be. And a lot of that is out of our hands. So I mentioned that we did complete an, an audit of the department. Uh, that included not only the department, but all the key users of IT across the county. So we got feedback from all those departments, like what are they seeing, what are they experiencing, and all that feedback went back into the, the findings and recommendations that came out of that. Um, a fun note, I suppose, is that uh, Director Hawker and I, we've been working with the counties Association uh, and others to have a statewide conversation uh, about how counties are approaching IT. Uh, there's a survey going around now to kind of identify what systems are people using, how are you interfacing with the state and things like that. Because I'll tell you right now, the state of Wisconsin's approach to IT is very dysfunctional. It's not standardized at all. And when it comes to IT, you, you want standardization for all kinds of reasons. So that presents more headaches than I can list here. But suffice it to say, we're trying to figure out are there any proactive steps we can take and help counties help each other out to, to do things a little bit better. And as you'll note, Director Hawker is also retiring, and the recruitment process for that has also been initiated. Uh, the next one is planning and zoning. Real quickly, there's currently a work plan. Uh, there's work for a work plan around groundwater issues in Nelsonville. That's in progress. Uh, the options that may come out of that could be high cost, but we're going to look at all the paths that would that would be possible for any of that at the committee and see, you know. Any final decision is going to have to look at any of the potentials to see what makes the most sense and how does it make sense. Um, also, the North Central Wisconsin Regional Planning Commission, we're, we're a member for that. Again, I kept that in the budget uh, for a number of reasons, but uh, it's helping with our sewer service uh, planning, which includes all the municipalities that have sewer service. Uh, we're also running some economic development conversations through them and the SBA, or SBDC, I should say. And also for the outline areas, it doesn't have to be outlined, could be any municipality, they can get their roads rated for free by the commission. So a lot of municipalities have taken them up on that this year. And that's a huge thing for a town to say, hey, you go do all this road rating work for us and then come back and we'll have sort of a standardized you know, format every year. So that's a, that's a major perk for membership. And Director Schuler is retiring in January and recruitment is ongoing. <laughs> Uh, just give you a sense of who's how things are shaping up from the uh, department leadership front. Medical examiner, we we've heard a bit about regional morgue conversations. Uh, most of that conversation has been happening at Marathon County, and I'll say that initially there was maybe some part of it where Portage County would have kind of worked with them directly, maybe contributed something financially. That's not happening now. We're still a strong partner. We're still involved in the conversations, but um, but they're kind of taking the lead on that. They've got some interesting partnerships they're exploring. Uh, but we'll see how it plays out. It would be a very good resource, not only for us, but for all of the northern counties, because right now there's only two or three medical examiners in the entire state. Uh, and we're probably going to be down to two soon because one's retiring. So then the options people have are next to none. Uh, a lot of costs have increased due to higher than average numbers in 21. Uh, Rife, Scott Raffelman puts together his annual report, so I encourage you to look at that. And he's also retiring soon, and the recruitment process is ongoing. I see a trend here. Yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think that's the last one that I know of anyway. Um, clerk of courts, I just want to touch upon because I'm sure you're all aware now that trials by jury resumed in August 21. So the case backlog, it, you know, it's a significant challenge to work through. I see the DAs here, it's certainly the same for him. Anybody related to the courts at this point is being faced with, you know, what initially started out as maybe one jury trial per week per month. Now it's two, three, and then they're double stacking cases because they don't know how the case might plea. And so you're having to prepare for all kinds of potential outcomes that you don't know where they're going to go. And so there's a lot more prep work involved because if this one pleads out, you need to pick that one up and move. So the clerk of courts, DA's office, family court commissioner down below, which I'll touch on quickly, uh, they're all faced with a backlog of cases and just workload is just through the roof. Uh, I did uh, initiate a conversation with those department heads to say, 
what can we do for you to help you get back to closer to normal, I suppose, in terms of your day-to-day -day lives uh, through the American Rescue Plan Act funding? Like, are there things that we can fund that would assist you there? So that conversation is ongoing. Family, family Court Commissioner, similar story. Uh, there's a position moved from the clerk of courts to the Family Court Commissioner based on uh, workload there. Um, there it's initially a half-time position, but we've taken some steps to add some hours. Now it's only eight hours right now, but it's enough time to help balance out some of the things that the Family Court Commissioner was doing so that she can actually work these cases through to resolution quicker on her end and not have to do some of the things that that other person might have been doing uh, if they weren't half-time. So that's also part of that courts package that we're working on. And also she and others, just in general, the cases that, whether it's HHS, the DA, Family Court Commissioner, whoever, the cases that people are seeing are generally just more complex. There's more layers to them than, the, than there has been in the past. And so it's just, that's just exacerbating all the different pressures that these people are facing. Okay, moving to solid waste. Uh, you're aware of this, but I just wanna accentuate that, you know, that department has taken some very proactive steps, some hard decisions to try to situate themselves uh, for hopefully something that will work out if this two year sort of experiment as part of this contract works. Uh, everybody's working hard on it. John's is working on it. Amanda's working on it. Everybody who can is contributing because if that works, it'll stabilize that something like re the recycling market, which has been volatile, it's mandated, and it's one of those things that you'd have no control over, but you have to handle. So this was the best possible option. It did lead to some, a recycling fee being charged, but uh, there's a per capita fee, I think it's $2.09 there. That's the first for Portage County, but I will say that the counties that charge a per capita fee for recycling, and there will be more of them because they can't ex continually increase their tipping fees to balance it out, uh, are much higher than, than the $2. And so they, the Solid Waste Board did a good job of balancing out. They added a little tipping fee. They added this fee. That, is, that should be temporary. If the contract works, that will provide some stability and drop that back down and everybody would be in a much better position. And what, what I mean by more, I mean like, I think it's uh, Washburn and Burnett counties, for instance, they're like at six bucks per person. Uh, Barron County, they do a per parcel charge of 24 or $36 to cover their recycling fees. And these are all things that we explored in those conversations, but the outcome we, you saw in front of you and that you recently addressed is the best best path, best, best option we had to, to take. So um, lots of energy going into that conversation right now. Uh, in highway, <clears throat> I just highlighted a few of the things that you probably hear a lot about, GTAs, you know, uh, general transportation aids. Those are estimated to increase 2%, but the 2021 GTAs were a little lower, so actually it, it, it led to a decrease of 16,925 overall between the two years. Um, the, the local road improvements program, that's roughly half a million dollars for County Road HH and County Road Z. That's an increase from 21 to 22, which is nice to see. Uh, the RMA, or the state's routine maintenance agreement, so we do a lot of work on behalf of the state. That's budgeted to remain the same as it was, which is nice. There's 15 people out of highway who work on that state patrol crew, and that RMA uh, provides funding for them to do their work. Uh, the personnel services reflected a 1.8% decrease here, uh, but that was due to a projected decrease in the incidental labor rate. And so there's lots of different cost pools and calculations that go into figuring out what that number looks like. So I just wanted to note, if you saw that, like, what is that about? That's what's driving that. Uh, and grants, contributions, and indemnities, they increased basically because we have planned bridge A projects that will be completed in 22. So that's bridge and culvert uh, levy. Uh, and the last but not least, you'll note, and this is something that not only we face, but towns and everybody else doing roads, uh, supplies and expenses for us went up almost 11% because the increase of construction projects, but more importantly, the increase in material prices. And there's not a lot of options to get those materials either. So if you have double digit increases every year, it's hard to do road projects. <clears throat> so parks, Ryan is here. So uh, yay, Ryan, good to see you. Uh, we always joke with Ryan and say we cut his department, but that could be the furthest thing from the truth because it's a department where there's actually a lot of revenues being generated, and that was a significant increase this year. And you'll see that around a third of his budget originates from those user fees and revenues, so that's a big deal. Uh, and the, those services, those charges increased by over $100,000 when you base it off a two-year average, so that's a huge increase. Now, 
it's hard to expand a lot of the parks because it requires some funding, et cetera, but there are a lot of improvements going that should add opportunities for people to expand the ways that they use the facilities and the parks that we have. So I think that uh, you'll see more increases there because based on my attempts to get a campsite scheduled next year, um, <laughs> people are already locking them up. Library, uh, we don't hear a lot from the library, but Larry and his crew do a really good job over there. It was one of the departments that got hit pretty hard by the pandemic. They, people come to them, right? So they had to figure out how do we deal with this? Uh, but just some numbers to kind of reflect what they've done. So in 2020, which is the most recent completed year of numbers, the, they had 22,000 registered borrowers check out a quarter million, a quarter million physical items and 82,697 digital items. This year, they're up total circulation almost 50% again. So everybody who jumped on the library wagon last year, they're, they're bringing their friends. Uh, digital checkouts increased. That's audiobooks, ebooks, music, things like that. Those are up. And also the library is a community computing center, which is for those of us that carry a computer in our pockets uh, might not be meaningful. But for anybody in the community who doesn't or who doesn't necessarily have a great connection at home or whatever it might be, that's a huge resource for them. And so I wanted to just show that they had over 10,000 sessions in 2020 just on their library computers. And on Wi-Fi, they had 242,000 sessions. So that's, that's a really important service to the community. And it's one of the few places you can go where you're not expected to pay for it. So that's a huge service that we provide for the members of the, uh, members of the public. And of course, they had their curbside program. And so they did a little over 6,000 curbside pickups. People love that program. Uh, Register of Deeds uh, should be no surprise to anybody that we have more home selling and the selling prices are up. Uh, we'll see how long that stays up, but uh, the public charges for services did increase as well because people are accessing online services and basically needing to do a lot of transactions through the Register of Deeds. Uh, Cindy's thinking that the 22, 2022 will see the prices and demands of homes staying high, uh, lower interest rate probably as well, and then the public access revenues, same deal, using the online avenues that should increase and they're another area where they're taking records off the as 400 and moving it onto a separate computer uh, there's a lot of very good reasons to do that i won't cover them again but anytime you see as 400 try to get rid of it uh, the portage county business park so there's a there's a first state bank building that's going to be completed there's two new medical clinics being constructed out there the delta dental headquarters is being constructed out there uh, we need to do some updates to signs and some landscaping, but ultimately with all the parcels being sold, we're going to start having conversations about how to hand that park over uh, to the people who now inhabit it. And that's a, that's a really big deal for, for a project that started uh, decades ago. Uh, I'll just touch quickly on, a, on the budget task force. So Jenny and her team, Supervisor Robbie, Supervisor Morrow and I, we've been having conversations on this budget task force to kind of vet some of the policy ideas that we have before we bring them to finance and have a more robust discussion there. That's been very beneficial because it's a conversation we've needed to have because of time constraints or just trying to figure out what's the best way to do this. Uh, it hasn't happened as well until now. So there, we're getting a lot of progress there and I think you'll start to see a lot of really uh, good ideas, good policy, best practices, some of those which are kind of done for us by GFOA and others, uh, but kind of adopting them into the county's practices is going to be a big deal for us. Uh, the state and local fiscal recovery funds, or the SLFRF, also known as the American Rescue Plan Act. Um, recent guidance from the Treasury, no surprise because I think they got 10,000 questions from, the, from people like us, uh, extended deadlines into next year. So they've moved deadlines months ahead before they're more likely to issue their final rule. So right now we have an interim final rule, which is kind of ambiguous in places. And they also coupled their extension by saying, if you spend on the interim final rule, we won't seek recoupment if it ends up not being in line with the final <coughs> rule. Uh, not a lot of people are super comfortable with that, but that's just happened this week, essentially. So there'll be a lot more conversations about how best to approach that update. Uh, there's one distinction, too, that I want to point out is that the funds that I keep referencing in the Rescue Plan Act, it's a big act. And so there's a lot of funds that are also just being funneled directly to departments, okay? So that's separate from the $13.7 million that Portage County is ultimately going to have to, to utilize for all these different programs. Um, 
These funds are also not in the budget that's presented to you today. We are tracking the costs, obviously, but we're treating them independently. So if you think about it, like you've got a separate checking account, it's like a separate checking account. It's tracked on its own. We're not putting it into the budget, but it will certainly play into the budget as that money is being spent and tracked. And so I just wanted to make sure that you weren't looking for something that wasn't there. Uh, we have done an initial estimate on our lost revenue. Lost revenue funding is important because there's a lot of flexibility with how you use it outside of the four main areas that they've identified in the interim final rule. Um, we know one year, uh, you can project out, but part of our discussion at the County Association call next week is gonna be don't use your, don't spend your projection because you don't know what your lost revenue is gonna be next year or down the line. So, um, but the point is, is that that funding is when it's identified, we can kind of set it aside and say, well, if we have known eligible expenses under the interim rule, we can do that. If it's kind of a gray area, maybe we tap the lost revenue portion so that we can make sure that when we get audited by the U.S. Treasury, we'll have all the justifications in place and it will mesh with the guidance that they provided. Um, I alluded to it just now, but Jenny and I will be talking to the WCA, a lot of different counties on their Monday call to kind of just give some broad strategies because it's ambiguous, it's somewhat confusing, and it's a lot of funding for folks. So people are wanting to do things correctly, but counties have a lot of different approaches. And so we also just want to remind people like, you know, if La Crosse County says do this, uh, don't just do this, you know, look at what you do and how you do it before you try to mirror what they're doing so that again, at the end of the day, you're gonna get audited. And if you say, well, the cross county did it that way, I'm not sure Treasury's gonna care. Um, uh, no disrespect to La Crosse County, they have a lovely administrator and we were all just there last week, beautiful place. Uh, anyway, the initial focus, as you know, has been on Portage County. That's why we brought Health and Human Services to you first. These are known negative impacts. Same with the courts package, that was step two. You know, any of these knowns, that need to be addressed are the things that you're gonna see first because there's not a whole lot to deliberate. Like it, there's known problems, let's address them. Um, there may be some additional steps we might take through the United Way. We do a lot of prevention work with them through Health and Human Services. And that is really key work to do because if you prevent people from getting into the system in the first place, not only is that much better for the people involved, it's also good from a fiscal perspective because I'll tell you right now, the state's not doing us any favors for the charges they're, they're giving us to send people to Winnebago or wherever. Uh, those costs continue to go up and we're not getting uh, the resources to, to match the, those increases. Um, I've, already, I've alluded to the courts package, that's under discussion, so we'll see what we can get out of that. Um, <clears throat> on the bottom slide there, one of the eligible areas is water. There's, it's somewhat convoluted in how they approach it. They're, they refer you to how EPA treats water quality and water quantity issues. Uh, but I'm, already, I'm having some internal discussions with staff. I spoke with Chair Haga uh, actually yesterday about some of this to bring a package forward through land and water for sort of short-term solutions. Like we know there are residents who have high nitrates. Maybe we can help cost share a, a, a reverse osmosis system. We know that churches and bars and others out in the outlying areas, they have wells that are considered sort of public, TNCs. And so the DNR was more was likely gonna start, you know, turning the screws on them in 2019, 2020, but then the pandemic hit, so they kind of hit pause. But if and when DNR starts picking that back up, they're gonna have some replacement costs for some of their water systems that will be challenging for businesses and others who just don't have the same sort of revenue streams that they had previously. So if we can help them out as well, it's a small part of economic development that we can that we can do for them. And we've also recently, Chair Haga and I have been on some conversations about broadband expansion. The long and short of that is figuring out where's the private sector at, where are the gaps at, and then how do we use some of this new technology to fill those gaps. Uh, so that's very preliminary, but that, uh, it's one of the main areas that's in the act. And so we've had those conversations already and we'll have more. Uh, so moving forward, you know, obviously the American Rescue Plan Act funds are going to be useful. We can spend those through the end of 2024. So I've emphasized from day one because we do get a lot of questions and requests for that funding to say we need to be prudent, we need to take our time, and we need to leverage those funds, not so much as a return on investment in a traditional sense, but we're in, we, we entered into the COVID-19 pandemic in this situation. Now these funds are supposed to help us get through that, but how can we leverage them in a way that our post-COVID-19 scenarios 
are much improved and better than where we were before the pandemic, as, as if it didn't even exist. And so that's kind of the thinking that goes into that. Um, uncertainty certainly is a challenge still, uh, but I think this year we've got a lot more knowns. People are a little more comfortable with things, whether that be you know, the science involved, the economics involved. There's still a lot of big questions though. And so some of the ways you might ask questions about uh, the economy or things that kind of inform how you think about budgeting and things like that. There's still areas that that uncertainty is is uh, challenging. I'll just put it that way. Uh, but it, we all know that's having a lot of impacts on, on our social lives, our economic lives, our business lives everywhere. So uh, hopefully as time goes on, we'll have less uncertainty and uh, that should help. And finally, just a big thank you to the finance department staff for all their work. Thanks to the department heads. They, they really, they really crunch the numbers to try to hit that 0%. Our budget hearings are always very productive conversations. We learn a lot about some of the nuances uh, in those conversations, and I try to reflect that through those decisions, but also what I'm bringing to you. Uh, but also thanks to you for all the things that you've done and your predecessors have done, because I've pointed to it from the debt service and beyond. Like, Portage County is in a good financial position, all things considered. It's not great or necessarily something you'd want to write home about in, 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 the, in the ideal sense, but given the cards that we've been dealt, uh, the county's done an incredible job of, of playing those cards effectively. And so hopefully we'll keep doing that. And if you have any questions, I suppose I can answer them or try. Supervisor Matt Chikowski. I do have one quick question, Executive Holman, and thank you for your presentation. Um, the Medicaid reimbursement rate um, bullet point under the health care, mm -hmm. um, it says the average cost for providing service for a Medicaid resident is five twenty seventy three. Is that our average cost, a national average cost? That's not? our average cost as of today. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Supervisor Dodge. As chair of finance, I just want to add my thanks to everyone on the list that Chris thanked. Um, it's been a rough year, and um, hopefully next year will be better, but everybody's done a heck of a job doing their budget and sticking to what they needed to do. Supervisor Robbie. Just a real quick question. Um, I see the, the increase is 1.2%, but in the steps, what, what kind of a percent is represented by each step, or is it not c consistent? It varies on position and where you're at based on term years in service, things like that. So, you know, it could be 1%, 2%, like your higher end positions are probably going to have a 1%. Some of that middle of the road would be 2 Your brand new people, or if they're starting out at step one, might be a 3 It It does vary. And some of the conversations are even around those initial steps in the salary plan. And we're, we're talking to <laughs> HR about having an update to that plan. And one of the things would be that we would potentially consider would be even removing steps one and two altogether so that you, they just have that, that bump up that way. But it does vary. It depends on the person, but I think, I, I don't know off the top of my head what the average across the County would be, but it, you know, it's like one to three and then, and then plus 1.25 wherever they are. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? And don't forget, Jenny's following up, so she's got the, uh, the hard numbers. Mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> Everybody's excited. All right, thanks. Thank you for the opportunity to present tonight to you um, the uh, proposed budget for 2022. Um, I'm going to uh, kind of walk you through the budget in brief. There's two documents that we work on. One's the overall budget document. Can you hear me okay? okay. One's the overall budget document and one's the budget in brief. So what you have before you tonight is the budget in brief. Both of these documents will be placed on the county's website. I just checked a little bit ago and they're not up there yet, but they will be, um, if not yet tonight, they will be there tomorrow. Um, in the budget in brief, 
the first couple pages are the letter from the executive, uh, organizational chart of the county, um, uh, just a few other highlights on community profile and some statistics about our county. I'm going to jump ahead to the tax levy summary and kind of review that. Um, this is just a representation of uh, what makes up our tax levy and kind of um, the different areas and how it compares to the previous year. Uh, previous year tax levy was 32,736,593, um, which is almost a $670,000 increase. Um, if you look on the uh, total levy um, uh, chart, um, that three really is an eight. If your eyes are as bad as mine, you thought it was an eight, but it should have been, and it ended up being a three. That was corrected for what was posted on the web, uh, just to let you know. But if you got it in advance or if it's at your place, um, that correction has already been made. On the next page um, is the county-wide budget summary. I'm just going to give you some highlights and some explanation of the different categories in comparison of the modified budget to the 2022 bu budget. Um, the reason the budget for 21 is modified because at this time of the year we adopt a budget and throughout the year we change it because uh, as you know, things change. We get new grants, uh, we have uh, new expectations or new things to deal with and we modify as we go. Um, if we look at taxes, you can see we have overall a 2.61% increase. Now taxes here represent not only county property taxes or the levy, but also things like sales tax or um, there are certain fees within the Registry of Deeds office that they collect that are considered a tax. So that's one of the reasons that that went up. But the major increases in that category would be the combination of the taxes uh, six, about $670,000 and the increase in sales tax, which was about $420,000. Intergovernmental revenue um, has a slight decrease of 0.67%. Um, the reason for this in comparison to the modified budget is there are many changes throughout this year and even looking into next year in terms of what we can anticipate for various grants. Um, but Two grants that were very large that were removed was we had a $150,000 uh, Department of Justice uh, grant for coronavirus for equipment in the Sheriff's Department. That was this year, that is removed for next year because it was one time. As well as we had two um, TLM grants, targeted runoff management grants, and those are each $150,000 a piece. And that was in 2021, but removed for 2022. So that's what causes that decrease. Grants overall did go up in other areas, but those removal of those one-time grants caused that decrease. Um, licenses and permits um, went up uh, just for activity based on what's happening. Um, at Health and Human Services for the licenses that they issue. Fines, forfeits, and penalties had a 3% increase, um, and that's for uh, fees collected in the clerk of court office. Public charges for services had a decline. Um, many areas had increases. However, the significant decrease um, that had caused this was in the healthcare center revenue. So our revenue that we're taking in uh, related to um, healthcare center operations declined significantly because the number of residents um, have gone down significantly. So that's what's driving that decrease there. Intergovernmental charges for services. Um, you will see a uh, increase in this category of 4.8.3%. Um, um, those increases are relative to um, increase in IT uh, allocation charges. Um, that's where the revenue is offset for the, what the departments are um, paying for IT services. So that's their income to run um, their department, as well as um, increases for highway um, based on projects and construction projects they're going to do, as well as we talked a little bit earlier about that parks revenue. Parks revenue is projected to be up over $100,000. Um, Miscellaneous um, uh, uh, revenue. Um, one of the things uh, to highlight here that would reflect the decline in miscellaneous revenue um, would be investment income. 
um, in terms of interest on investments. Um, we have uh, um, also a decline uh, relative to business park sales. Um, we don't aren't projecting any business park sales in 2022 because the lots are all sold. Um, so that would be a change from 21 to 22. <laughs> What is offsetting that miscellaneous revenue or causing it to increase would be we are projecting some uh, reimbursements in health insurance for stop loss. So that's um, uh, uh, helping that number along a little bit um, in terms of how we got to that. No proceeds plan for 2022 are for two projects, one for highway projects and the other would be for the wetland mitigation project. That's also related to highway as well, um, but that would be through the capital fund. Um, other financing sources um, has for various um, uh, fund balance usages that have decreased because we're not anticipating them in 2022. Um, fund balance applied um, for um, uh, health insurance, EMS, highway and capital improvements. Uh, the largest decline was for uh, capital improvements. Um, health insurance would have been an increase in fund balance usage. EMS would have been a decline because we had specific equipment purchases we were using, um, which was about $831,000. Um, and highway had some fund balance usage because they were specifically using uh, vehicle registration fees that they had um, saved to use for projects in 2021 that they won't be using in 2022. Um, expenditures by classification, this is just kind of how we look at various um, types of uh, expenditures by the type of function um, that they fit under. General government had an 8.3.8% growth um, due to increased projections for health insurance expenses of about $1.2 million. And we had increased expenses in IT. Um, one of the things was the new position. We had some significant increases in contracts and we also had increases to fixed costs um, for IT services. So those are the major factors driving those numbers in the general government class. In public safety, we have about a 1.98% increase. Um, some of the primary factors um, and when I say this, other than normal kind of increases like wages and things that we kind of uh, spelled out, um, other uh, increases would be the addition of a, a new position in the sheriff's office, um, some increases to their IT costs in, in law enforcement, contracts in law enforcement as well. Um, we added a peer support specialist contract in uh, justice programs that will be funded by the TAD grant. And um, we have a 2.5% increase to uh, provider agreements for EMS. In public works, um, the increase of almost $2.6 million is attribu uh, attributable to construction projects, uh, increases in supply costs, and um, the increase that you heard earlier from the county executive to solid waste for the uh, new um, operating contract with Johns Recycling. Um, health and Human Services, um, it's a little odd to see this number only at $9,300, but um, what, uh, how we get to that is we had significant increases in Health and Human Services. They were offset by the decreases that happened in healthcare center. So the increases that happened in Human Services related to the grants and things that they have going on, um, was completely kind of offset by the decrease within the healthcare center. So that's how that number kind of came to be. Um, culture Rec and Ed, um, within the Culture Rec and Ed division, the most significant uh, thing to point out would be the addition of the seasonal park manager. Most of the other types of increases are just kind of normal operational increases. Conservation and development, I mentioned earlier, but this 11.5% decrease is um, uh, relates to the removal of the two grants for the targeted runoff management of $300,000. That's what's driving that decrease. Another thing that um, was impacting that decrease was also a decrease in the contracts related to the business park. Uh, capital outlay has a significant increase and that has to do with uh, project completion. One of the things that we do with uh, capital is um, we will allocate uh, projects 
in 2022, we usually only put in the new budget, new projects or transfers or things that we need to incorporate to do new projects. We will take at the end of 21, when we know how much we spent on the projects that are currently ongoing, and we will, when we close the fiscal year, we will rebudget those projects if they have remaining balances forward. So we usually don't do that at budget time. We'll do that at the end of the fiscal year because it's hard to know what that balance is going to be until we're kind of done with the year. Um, so we typically only budget new projects or known kinds of projects or transfers or costs. So that's why you see a significant decrease there. Debt service has just a slight increase of 1.32% based on the uh, plan debt schedule. And then other financing uses is based on plan fund balance use with things like uh, uh, plan fund balance designations of um, uh, projects or uh, items where we might anticipate putting into fund balance for a later year where we might have a surplus uh, planned. Um, next slide. It's just kind of a summary by fund. Within the county, we operate within funds. We have general funds, special revenue funds, debt service capital, enterprise, and internal service. And then within a couple of those, there's sub funds. Um, we have multiple special revenue funds um, in which we report under. This document gives you the projected starting balance of the fund balances in each of those funds. And it's, I say projected because I, I don't know what's gonna happen before 1231, but it's our best guess based on how people projected. The property tax by fund, any revenues um, that we anticipate within that fund, any transfers for, it, for total revenues. Transfers in will match the transfers out under expenses. Any expenses within that fund to get a total, any fund balance we either plan on on adding to fund balance or any fund balance we plan on using uh, to support the uh, 2022 operating budget and then the projected fund balance in each fund. Um, wanted to just kind of point out to you under the property tax column how the property tax is um, allocated to each of the funds. It resides or it's allocated to the general fund Highway, Health and Human Services, Aging and Disability Resource Center, and EMS Ambulance Services. In capital projects, there's an amount allocated there as well as debt service. And the enterprise fund that receives tax levy is the health care center for the total of the overall tax levy of 33,406,098. Um, fund balance used highlights for you on that column. Um, highway plans on um, um, uh, applying uh, uh, just over a million dollars that's due to vehicle registration fees in 2022. Um, healthcare, meaning they're going to save for later because they will borrow in 2022. They will use vehicle registration fees again in 2023. Healthcare Center is planning on using just over 1.1 million in 2022. And health insurance is planning on using um, almost 1.3 or almost uh, just over 1.3 million. Again, the health insurance fund, uh, just because we see a use of fund balance, it isn't necessarily a, a negative thing. This is a planned and strategic use of fund balance that's existing in that current fund now. Um, the next two pages is very similar information, but instead of breaking it out by fund, it's broken out by classification or by function area of how the money's spent, whether it's public safety or public works or general government. Uh, it's broken out by those categories rather than by accounting fund. But similar, inf same information, just a little different look at the data. Um, revenue highlights are 2022 revenue, revenue highlights, a pie chart. Um, just a couple of things that I, I wanted to point out here. This is just kind of a, a picture of what I kind of just shared a little bit earlier of how the money is split out across the county in the different categories. There were two areas uh, where the percentages from the previous year actually increased. And that would be in no proceeds last year we spent uh, 
We had zero percent associated with no no proceeds. Actually, I mean this year, 2021, and 2022, we're expecting that'll be 4.54 percent of the budget. And in intergovernmental charges for services, that went um, up from 2020, 22.65% and is now at 23.17. Every other category had a slight decline to it, but pretty much on the mark in terms of where it was at. So for example, taxes last year was 36.8%. Intergovernmental revenues last year were 15.51%. So very similar, nothing shifted um, dramatically for the county. The next slide, um, 2022 expenditures by classification. Again, same uh, dollar values that we're looking at, but again, just a visual of how we're kind of split up. We had um, two categories of increases um, over the previous year. Public works last year was 23.27%. In 2022, it would be at 25.03. And general government was at 19.91%, and it would be going up to 20.86. Again, all the other categories were very similar. For example, public safety last year was 14.99%, and health and human services was 26.59% overall. So just a little bit of a comparison so that you can see that the numbers haven't shifted um, too much. Um, expenditures by type is the next one that I would just kind of review. Rather than by classification or the type of program, this is what we spend the expenses on. Um, and we did have some variations here. Um, in terms of increases from last year to this year, contractual services last year was 38.64%, and it is... Um, 40.58% this year. Supplies was 68.84% um, going up to 7.15. Fixed charges were 3.65 going up to 4.13. Grants, contributions, indemnities, 0.73% um, last year jumping to 0.88. And transfers to other funds were 0.13 um, going up to 0.18%. This also breaks out the expenses a little bit different in categories in terms of personnel services, which are your, your people costs, contractual services, which are your hired vendor um, expenses, supplies expenses, building materials, uh, fixed charges, debt service, grants, contributions, and indemnities. That's mainly things like um, rent ready or business council uh, arrangement, uh, capital projects, and then transfers to other funds or uh, future operations designating future operations again is to save a certain amount of funds for the future. Um, when you look at personnel, you can see the amount change of a negative $301. Um, that doesn't mean that um, what we said earlier is not true. We are planning for 1.25% increase to um, wages along with some other um, uh, increases to elected officials' uh, compensation and such um, that are at some different rates. But one of the contributing factors to this number that makes it uh, appear as a, a overall decline or that it is an overall decline is the decreases in the healthcare center budget. When you budget uh, for in 2021 for 50 residents a day and you budget in 20. 22 for 35 residents a day, you budget based on staffing. And so the need for staffing declined based on the number of uh, residents they have placed in their bu budget in terms of how they're operating today. Um, and they really are looking at their costs and trying to operate as efficiently as, as they possibly can. Um, that was just shy of $600,000 decrease in personnel costs alone. In highway, um, there was an overall decrease of almost $262,000 um, related to personnel costs. And the reason for that in highway is um, how they uh, record incidental labor because the incidental labor from 2021 to 2022 decreased um, at the rate it did. 
Um, so when we apply the cost allocations back against personnel costs, um, it decreases that number as well. So I wanted to point that out and kind of um, explain it a little bit because on the surface, it looks a little odd, um, but there are reasons for that. And two of the, the decreases that impact that number um, for almost $860,000 would be why that looks the way it does. Uh, next page. Um, this is a, a summary of the uh, uh, fund balance. Um, what our starting balance was on 1-1-2021 and our anticipated fund balance at the end of 2021 um, by type of fund um, within uh, or overall for the county fund balance or, or fund balance and net assets are projected to go down. The only fund that we would project an increase in for 2021 would be the general fund. We are projecting an increase of almost $1.3 million in general fund surplus. Um, that's related to uh, st staff savings and vacancies, um, underspending additional revenues that we weren't anticipating, as well as transfers from other funds that we had a savings in as well. Um, that puts us at a uh, 25.2% uh, limit on the general fund in terms of um, its percentage in comparison to where, where a fund balance policy puts us. Um, because it was 0.2% over, and I talked to the finance committee about this last night as well, um, we're gonna monitor that because that could change between now and the end of the year. Um, if it would go under the 25%, we'd be within our fund balance policy limit. If it would go higher, um, we would do our, or prepare some type of transfer probably to capital improvements. It's very close to where the limit is at 25%. Um, so we're just going to kind of watch that through the remainder of this year and see where um, that number is going to um, end up. And the next page is the 2022 estimated fund balance. Um, based on the 22 expenditures and revenues and planned uses of fund balance, um, we would project increases in the special revenue funds and the capital projects fund. Debt service would remain flat and the other funds would be decreases for an overall decrease within the county. Um, the unassigned balance in the general fund in the 2022 budget planning would put us at 23.5% based on the calculation of where our limit is within the fund balance policy. So in 2022, there's uh, not projected to be an issue based on the anticipated expenditures in the funds that apply to the policy. Uh, just a kind of a reminder on fund balances, uh, non-spendable is is not fund balance we can use. It's usually tied up in kind of future obligations or perhaps, you know, um, the most common and what the majority of that balance is, is related to um, uh, tax deeds or tax deed parcels, um, property owned uh, tax deed parcels. Uh, restricted is because someone outside this body has placed restrictions on the funding, meaning the state, uh, State Department, maybe a donor who's provided the county money. Committed is assigned by this board. Assigned could be with by this board or by the finance committee or by the executive. And unassigned is, is, is not assigned to anything. Um, it's kind of what the remainder is after all of those calculations and that can be used at the county's discretion. Our current fund balance policy is to say between 15 and 25% of uh, total of expenditures that have um, levy associated with them. So the general fund, EMS, uh, debt, uh, health and human services, highway, and I'm going from memory. I feel like I missed one. It excludes capital and ADRC. Um, next slide, please. 
put in here a couple pages about budget process and budget timeline. The only thing I'll point out for this is after the presentation this month at the committee level or however um, you want to talk about the budget, the board has a month to kind of talk and, and debate or discuss or reevaluate what's placed in the budget and what it means um, so that you are ready to come back on November 2nd and adopt a budget. So you have this month to kind of look it over, ask questions, meet about it, make suggestions. Um, now is your time. Um, there's also a, some budget policies and just general information about how the county operates within a budget policy and then also what the state standards are. Next slide. Included in here for reference, the county strategic plan. Um, included as well is a listing of the capital projects that are in the budget. A um, couple highlights here under public works. Both the wetland mitigation and highway projects um, have anticipated debt proceeds in next year's budget. Highway projects are recognized um, for uh, their costs within the special revenue fund for highways, where um, the other projects listed in here are in the capital improvement fund. That's why highway projects is in italics there. Other thing that I would point out is these projects were all included in the uh, plan that was adopted in August. With the exception of the culvert mapping and elevation model project under conservation development. That one um, uh, we were kind of knew about at budget time. It was kind of after the plan was adopted for the uh, next six years. So, um, uh, but the, the, the project itself um, w was uh, presented to us. So we did add it as a capital project for next year. That's funded with funds from, um, the planning and zoning department, as well as funds through land records. So there's no county levy needed, but we wanted to make sure that we got the funding within the, within the uh, next year's budget. Um, debt service should be the next slide. Um, the one thing I'll point out about here, uh, basically going through the two charts on the right side of your document, um, there's a summary of the notes outstanding um, that the county currently has and the balances on those, uh, the amount that uh, was issued and, and the balance remaining. Um, also included in here were the anticipated 22 debt issues um, so that we could calculate the county's allowable uh, levy and the percent of debt limit we had available. So after the calculation for 2022, we would have 94.4% remaining of our debt limit available. And there's a history there, so you can see that compared to 2020 and 2021. Jen, there, we have a promissory note in 2019, uh, and there's been an outstanding debt is the same as when it was issued. That one and the one in 2020, no reduction, made no payments. Correct, because those payments will be happening uh, I believe this year. Even the one it, for 2019? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I'll double check that, but I'm... It was just odd that it was, we hadn't made any payments even... I'll review, I'll review that again, but I'm pretty sure. Um, typically, the note that we would have issued, we would have had the first interest payments, but not necessarily the principal. Okay. No. Okay. Um, because we would have had them fit within the, the schedule that we did, but I'll, I'll double check it. I don't have it in front of me. Um, the only thing I'd say about outstanding debt limit, 94.4%, uh, um, that's great, but it's kind of like what I would, what my husband advises me at home, just because the credit card says you have $16,000 available <laughs> doesn't mean you have $16,000 available. Um, this is just a representation of the changes in um, uh, uh, equalized valuation by municipality over from year to year, just a comparison for your review. Um, this is also just a, a, a 
history of the county's levy, county tax rates. We did add this year the percent new, net new construction. Every year I go to see what previous years are. It was not on any documents. So I said, well, we're gonna put it in something so I can see um, just a kind of a history in comparison year by year. Position summary, this kind of gives you the changes in every department um, from 2021 to 2022. Clerk of Courts, you can see that they had a position uh, reduction. Uh, as you heard earlier, part of that position was transfer to Family Court Commissioner. It was a kind of a reassignment at work of where it better fit. Uh, surveyor, uh, the reason I highlighted this is we just, it's, it's not a change in the surveyor's office, but we did recognize that the FTE percentage of their surveyor that we kind of um, compensate is a 0.25% FTE and we wanted to recognize it somewhere. So we did include that this year. Information technology did have the increase of the one position, new position, as well as sheriff's office had the increase of one new position and highway. On the next page, there's lots of changes within Health and Human Services. Um, you can see the increase for new positions at uh, Health and Human Services. Uh, Aging and Disability Resource Center went up slightly. Um, there were some temporary um, reductions last year due to COVID that are uh, back in the budget in 2022. And Healthcare Center, you can see the decrease from the 77.58 FTE to 64.73. The one thing again, and it's noted on the bottom, healthcare center um, budgets by FTE, we don't count the positions themselves because there's a lot of movement constantly in 20 hours versus 30 hours and is, you know, the, just the shifting of what they need based on census. So we don't necessarily count positions. Um, there's a lot of detail of the ups and downs of what makes up these salary position changes in the budget document itself. Um, so there's a whole narrative section in there. So that's kind of the end of my, uh, my uh, summary. I hope um, it was valuable to you. Um, I just wanted to add that as we go forward and as you have a chance to review the budget itself, um, and if that is at a committee level or if you just have a question, please reach out. Um, if you want someone on finance staff to come to a meeting, we are more than happy to come and explain things or talk about things. Um, just uh, call us. We'd be happy to, uh, to help out in that way. And just a thank you to um, definitely my team in the finance department. Uh, they do a, a wonderful job um, always, but this time of the year I ask for more than I typically do. And I'm very appreciative of that. Um, thank the departments because really this is a team effort and they are really um, team players when it comes to getting this done. It's enjoyable to sit at a table and have departments who advocate for their own issues but also understand the bigger county picture that we're trying to um, solve um, and, and understand it in a way that they can contribute to it. Um, thank Chris um, for just um, really being supportive and, and thank you um, for allowing us to uh, present this and have the opportunity to do this. And thanks for staying awake. <laughs> Any questions? Supervisor Gifford. Yeah, and this might sound like a naive question, but out of that 94% um, of debt limit available, how much of that might be available for the law enforcement center that we're talking about uh, rather considerable sum of money as well as the uh, nursing home. So the, what, uh, uh, the finance committee has been having conversations about debt management and what impacts various decisions will have on debt management policy and the county's um, affordability um, to uh, debt service. Um, uh, two meetings ago, the finance committee looked at modeling um, that placed uh, into the model um, some existing debt service parameters of like $3 million a year for various capital projects at like 10 year paybacks and also a modeling of an $80 million project 
um, of any sort. We didn't identify what, what, what it was. Um, to look at the impacts that that had on the tax uh, rate, the tax levy, um, different debt ratios, how that might be viewed in a rating agency's eyes. Um, and so we're currently evaluating that. Um, there's many finance committee members here. I will say that I think they saw that 80 million impact on the surface wasn't as significant as they thought it might be, but it did raise some red flags in the areas of ratings and uh, debt ratios and things that we would put in a debt management policy that would be triggers for us and maybe that might be too high, um, but the numbers underneath that were were probably more doable. Did I answer that well enough to yeah, just keep you ready for next time? Comparable to other counties, how do we stand in that 94% that number compared to somewhere else that's... Uh, there's a, there's a um, report issued by the Department of Revenue every year that kind of gives that, I don't have it up, but I, I just from memory, I think it's kind of all over the board. Um, in terms of percentage. It depends on if a, if a county recently did a large project or not. You know, that's the thing that really throws that number is, is what was in their, what was in their um, recent history that would have made that number go up. And then you go, oh, they built a, they built a building, and then you know. Um, but yeah, so Finance Committee is currently having those conversations. Um, I, I think the, the conversation that we had was about um, what's affordability um, mean and from a debt management policy standpoint, what's really transparent and how we make that decision. Um, not so much talking about a project, but talking about what does debt management mean? I don't know if any of them had anything to add to that. I think for a county our size, we have relatively very little debt. Mm -hmm. uh, we're in very good, uh, standings as far as that goes compared to other counties our size? I would say we have very few debt issues with a quick payback, yeah. mm -hmm. um, but which make when that, if you look at the debt service and you look at when those come off, makes an opportunity for what fills when, it, when, it, when those payments happen. Okay. So there's an opportunity to place something at that time period forward. Supervisor Dodge. Um, I just want to say that the Finance Committee is being led by Ms. Josie, and um, we're very grateful. I think you're just on the edge of becoming a saint. Mm. <laughs> just a diver, though. No, I, <laughs> yeah, that's why I said I, she's only on the edge. I learned tonight that if you made one of the slides, you get to retire. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> Anybody else have any questions? With that, thank you. And if there's no other comments, and if I look at the agenda, it says that we'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Motion, motion by Supervisor Robbie, seconded by Supervisor Barry Jakowski. All those in favor with aye? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. We are adjourned. A video of this meeting is available for viewing on the city's website, stevenspoint.com slash videos.